Well, hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson, and the nightlight is on for Friday, April 12th, 2024. It has been a hellified week for those of us who work in media and journalism. First, an NPR insider published an article dragging his network, where he had worked for 25 years. And now Alex Garland's new movie, Civil War, depicts journalists as players in an America that has failed to learn from its own mistakes. As a journalist, I am feeling a way about this. I considered not doing the show tonight, but we're gonna do a show a little bit different, and I wanna talk about the future of the media and what you want from us, if you even know. Be sure to go to nightlightjoshua.com for all of my links or email me, joshua at nightlightshow.com. Good to be with you on a Friday. Hope you're getting ready to have a lovely weekend. I certainly am going to be picking out a formidable glass of wine when this broadcast is over. But it is good to see you. It's always good to be with you. I hope that you will please subscribe to me on YouTube at Nightlight Joshua. Like this live stream if you are enjoying yourself or if you hear something useful or helpful. And feel free to put your thoughts into the chat. Good to see some of you here, including Blue Moon on YouTube. Hello, I appreciate you being here as a new listener. Glad that you love what you're hearing. Welcome. Good to see you here. Hello to Pam. Thank you for being so welcoming to our new viewer. I appreciate that. Same Solange the First. I appreciate that as well. Dark Forever Clear. Good to see you. Lloyd. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Jean. Good to see you. Susan. Good to see you as well. Wonderful to see everybody tonight. Wonderful as always to see you. Thank you for being here. I hope that you have had a decent week. My week has sucked. <laughs> this has been a really hard week. It's been kind of one of those emotional up and down weeks that I am still learning how to talk about more openly. Because you got to remember, I'm a journalist, so we're not supposed to have these conversations. We're not supposed to quite be human beings, right? We're not supposed to quite be people. We're supposed to be kind of inured to it all in a, a little bit more, I don't know what the word is, but a little bit more subdued in all of this and just not not feel quite so much. But there's been a lot in the news this week. It's been a wild week of news. We got another big week of news coming up starting on Monday with Donald Trump's hush money trial, the whole Stormy Daniels thing. That's going to be his first uh, federal criminal trial. 
the first federal criminal trial for any president in American history. So that's going to be a huge deal. It's just, there's just a lot going on. <laughs> the world is a place. You've got the Biden administration preparing for the possibility that Iran might attack inside the war zone in or near Israel in retaliation for an attack against Iran. And so they're getting ready for the possibility of that sort of thing. It, it's just been kind of nonstop. It is really nonstop. And I would like to have focused on some of those other things this week. However, if you've been watching the program, or if you haven't, I'll catch up to speed. There was a piece that came out a few days ago that has set the social media blabosphere on fire. I don't know if you saw it, but it is a piece in an online publication called The Free Press. The Free Press is published on a platform called Substack, and this is the number one most read publication within Substack. Something like 630,000 people are subscribed to this. And there was an article published in it from a man named Yuri Berliner, who is a senior business editor at NPR News. And the article is entitled, I've been at NPR for 25 years. Here's how we lost America's trust. And in the piece, he goes through an array of different grievances that he's had with NPR's coverage over the last few years, which he argues has discredited the network to a large extent in its pull toward more progressive and liberal ideologies. He all but uses the word woke in the piece, but I kind of wish he would just come out and say it because I might have more respect for it then. But he published this piece and it has kind of set the internet's hair on fire. People who love NPR have come out in defense of it. People who have hated NPR since the beginning have said, ha, see, this is, we knew it was like this. I got a call from the relatively new cable network News Nation asking if I wanted to come on and talk about it. I said, yes. They said, you'll be speaking with Leland Vittert. And I said, great. And the interview went about as well as I expected. The next day I woke up and was just really ripped emotionally and was trying to make coffee and make breakfast Wednesday morning. And I just started bawling. Like I just broke down and cried. You know, when you cry so hard, you just, you want to, you want to throw something, you want to break something, but you know, you can't. And so you just kind of shake where you are. And you like, that was the cry. I've, I've almost like if a friend had been murdered, like that's the way it felt. And I know that's super graphic. I'm sorry about that, but that's kind of the way that it felt. And I just needed some time to process those feelings. And that's why I wrote a piece on my site, nightlightshow.com about how I had been feeling about all of this. And I tried to write it from the perspective, not only of what we should do now in terms of, okay, fine, you've made this attack. How do you respond? But also what it meant to me as a person. You know, I grew up listening to NPR, as did many, many people, although the overwhelming majority of listeners don't become journalists in public radio, but I did. I was trying to find a place where my perspective and my voice and my style and my kind of bookish nerdiness would be welcomed and NPR made sense. And I built a large, long career there from the station in Miami to the station in San Francisco to eventually becoming an NPR host on a show called 1A, which is based at WAMU in Washington. So just to be clear, I've never worked for NPR. I've done a show that ran on NPR, but I didn't work for the network. I worked for a station that kind of like Fresh Air, right? Fresh Air comes from WHYY in Philadelphia, but Terry Gross doesn't work for NPR. She works for WHYY. Same relationship. So I felt a very intense, acute wave of pain at this latest attack. And I think the reason that I felt it was because I thought that NPR was the place where I belonged. I never intended to have a career anywhere else but public media. And then my experience doing 1A was so difficult that I reached a point where I was just like, I, I need an escape hatch. I need to step away from this and maybe step back at some point, but right now I need to not be here. And then MSNBC opened its door, got bounced around there, went to NBC News, that lasted for about a year, and then they let me go. So that wasn't the right place. And now here I am in the second bedroom of my apartment here in Las Vegas, trying to build something else. And my, I think what I felt on Wednesday was this really deep existential sense that the one place where I knew, or at least strongly believed that I really belonged, could go away. That I really, but I wasn't there anymore. And so it just kind of made me feel that constant existential pain. Oh, 
I really don't belong anywhere. I'm trying to build something for myself. I'm glad you're here, but the only way this is going to happen, it feels like, is if I chisel it out for myself because nowhere has quite felt like home like that. And then it just sort of, all of that pain just washed in. And that's why I wrote the piece that I wrote and tried to put it in a, a larger sense than just the ways in which people listen to it and critique the coverage. But like, these are, these are people. There are communities of people who make these programs happen. I mean, I have rarely worked with people with the proficiency of the people that I worked with putting together 1A at WAMU. And eventually I got to meet some of the people who I had been listening to for years. I finally met Robert Siegel. The, the, excuse me. Robert Siegel of NPR's All Things Considered at a holiday party in D.C. Soon, like near the end of my time there. But I, it was amazing to be able to kind of close that loop. And I think that people need to realize that some of us take these attacks on NPR very seriously. And it has nothing to do with politics. It has everything to do with community. And I think that the weakness in the argument that this guy, Yuri Berliner, who wrote the piece, which I encourage you to read. You might as well read it. It's out there. I think the weakness in the argument is that people who connect with NPR don't connect because of ideology. We connect because of curiosity. We were looking for a place where people who are curious about the world are not only welcomed, but centered in the conversation. And your politics mean much less if you're willing to just take the trip, if you're willing to just go on the journey, ask the questions, hear the answers, and then you process your own emotions and beliefs about it on your own time. But we make a space where everybody is welcome and every subject is on the table. A lot of places don't do that. Now, if you don't like the point of view, that's one thing. Everyone has biases. Bias is human, right? So the idea that NPR was unbiased before something happened is asinine. Of course it has biases because bias is wired into the human experience. The question is how you deal with your biases and whether you can see them clearly enough to work around them. That's a conversation worth having. But this whole insert news organization here is biased, to me, is just stupid. Like, of course it's biased. The question is how well do they handle their biases? And the idea that this guy was asking a question that was not only not productive, but so myopic, such just a... A, 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 a B-League question, it, it just pissed me off. And it made me angry to feel that something that's so important to me and millions of other people all across the country and indeed around the world could be laid low by one of its own, by like a, a, a Judas, basically, a, a Benedict Arnold inside the room who didn't have the decency to work out his differences internally, but instead just you know, took a dump in the street in front of the headquarters, like that to me was just so offensive and it just hit me in a wave. And then after that, it got even deeper because I went to go see the new movie Civil War, which we had been talking about here on this program. I saw Civil War last night. It was very powerful. I got a lot out of the film. It is an extremely intense movie by Alex Garland, who wrote and directed the film. I watched it with my journalist's eyes, and so it kind of, I'm sure I watched the movie very differently than most people would watch the film. But it was a, it was a powerful movie. I wrote a piece on my Substack on nightlightshow.com, that basically breaks down some things to consider before you go see Civil War. And I'll, I'll go through some of those a little later in the show. I also, I haven't done this enough, but Substack allows you to put a voiceover of yourself basically doing the audiobook thing, reading your own article. So this also does have a voiceover of me reading it if you have not gotten enough of hearing me drone on and on. Anyway, so it's been a very emotionally draining week. And I got up today and I was like, I'm not doing a show today. Screw it. The, <laughs> the beauty of being your own boss, you can set your own off days. And I was like, I, damn it, I'm taking PTO today. And then I thought, no, 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 let me just go on and, and, and we'll talk. And this will probably be a much shorter broadcast than you're used to from me, which is fine because it's Friday. And some of y'all need some more time to do your taxes. Don't act like you don't. But I did at least want to come on and, and chat with you, partly because I'm beginning to make sense of it, partly because I also wanted to hear from you about this. You always make me feel better just by connecting with you. 
And partly because there's another piece of the story about like the media that moved today that I'd like to, to talk to you a little bit more about. I think what has me so bent is not only the nature of this article and the way that it came about, but also the fact that NPR already has the answers to this problem. And the more I think about it, and I've thought about this a bunch over the last few, well, I guess it's years now, the more that I felt like I'm really annoyed that NPR hasn't done more in the vein of 1A. Now, granted, I understand COVID shut the world down, right? We had a tremendous difficulty in making things keep moving because of COVID. And then after people began to gather in real space again, we kind of had to teach ourselves to do that again. I haven't been listening to 1A since I left. That is not unusual for me. Whenever I leave a job, I tend not to listen back or watch back to where I've been because I'm working on the next thing. That's just the way I'm wired. So it's not like, ah, I don't want to hear it. That's not, that's not the situation at all. So I don't know whether or not it, but 1A has been doing that work. Jen White, who's the host, is a terrific journalist. I would presume that she's doing yeoman's work because it's not easy to do 10 hours of live radio every week. So I presume she's doing great work and that the team is still trying to be that space for that connective American conversation. I feel like there are a lot of efforts to do that work. There are more of them now than before. Jeremy Hobson has a new show called The Middle, which is based, I think, at Illinois Public Media, which is... Um, in the Urbana-Champaign area just outside Chicago. And that show seems to be doing pretty well. And there are still programs in every, you know, in most major and medium-sized NPR markets where you can call in and talk about the issues of the day and, you know, you've got an opportunity to speak your mind, be heard on things that are local and national and so on. My old station KQED still does its show Forum, which has been on the air forever and ever. So it's not like no one is doing this work. But I feel like we need to have a better conversation between the press and the public about who each one is and what each expects from the other. We don't know each other anymore. And I would argue we might not have ever really known each other to begin with. I think if you have this idea in your mind, and some of y'all ain't go like this, but it's Friday. Y'all can't chase me through Vegas. If you had this idea in your mind that... We need to go back to the days of Walter Cronkite and Bob Edwards and the very cool, calm, straight newsman who just tells you the way it is and lets you make up your own mind. I have very bad news for you. Those news people were working with teams who made up their own minds about the news before they told you the facts. Everyone has biases. And in a room where everyone or most everyone looks the same, and lives the same, you're probably not going to get a diversity of viewpoints. But the marketing was much easier because there was much less competition, right? We are only recently in an era where satellite technology is available to everybody, particularly on your phone. GPS is satellite technology. So the idea that you will even have access to this number of varying contrasting points of view, including mine, is super ultra new. And it's very easy, I think, to feel like the present and the future are just smacking you real quickly. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. This was, this was simpler then. True, it was simpler. I would argue it was not necessarily better. I think it's better when you have more voices. Noisier, yes. More complicated, absolutely. But this is America. We're built for that. And I have a problem with the idea that we are supposed to have this perfect, even Stephen balance that's 50-50 or perfectly proportional to the U.S. population, as opposed to an ideological connection that's deeper than politics, that's deeper than race. Yuri Berliner's piece focused a lot on the racial composition of the audience as opposed to the U.S. population, as if NPR is working on a quota, and the supposed political leanings of the people who worked there. He went through voter registration data, which is highly problematic, particularly in D.C., because D.C., Maryland, and Virginia deal with voter information records very differently. So that was a BS statistic, and he should know better. But it also just cheapens the mission. 
We're not here to just reflect the country back as it is. We're here to explore ideas that are beyond the obvious. And I think somewhere along the way, it's important for you to know who you're dealing with in the press, what they want, what you want, and whether you're a fit. Very few organizations do this well. Some of the organizations on sites like Substack have to do this well because that's how we build audiences. We need to be able to target you very specifically. The problem is with NPR, when it was still active on Twitter, it's really hard to geotag or to hashtag curiosity and find people who have curiosity about the world. You can tag people demographically, you can tag people geographically, you can tag people politically, racially, by sex, you can tag people by their income level, by their educational level, by their interests, hobbies, but it's hard to tag people by their values. It's hard to make meaning on social media. Not impossible, but if that isn't gonna get the most clicks, it's not gonna get the most help. Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk are no friends of NPR. Elon Musk is openly hostile. Mark Zuckerberg could give a shit. So the work that we're trying to do is remarkably harder now. The work I'm trying to do is vastly harder now than it has ever, ever been. Because the tools to reach you are actively pulling us away from you. They make it harder to find you. So if we find you, it's more likely we'll find you on political levels because the systems are designed to funnel those. They're not designed to funnel curiosity, exploration, a pluralistic mindset, an ecumenical view of the world, intellectual pursuit. Like that's not what they're designed to do. It's way harder. So to be able to even meet this moment is just crushingly tough, crushingly tough. And on top of that, we are also reacquainting ourselves with one another. I loved being able to get on NPR and be like, I'm not going to lie about being black, but I'm going to be able to have conversations about race and racism in a way that acknowledges mine is not the only point of view in the room and that you at least need to know that I see you. You don't need to know that I agree with you. And what that did is it gave people permission not to worry about what I thought. It gave people permission to just tell me what they thought. And no, it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what you think. Now, if my thoughts should happen to slip out, that doesn't devalue what we're doing because we've built a rapport or we're trying to. And so the show built. And I worry that NPR is not doing that because I think that would solve a lot of this problem. I think if we were able to get people to understand that the whole political leaning thing is the laziest, most boring way to classify human beings, and that there are way more powerful ways to build community, we might be able to get above the noise. I don't know if the network has the wherewithal or the courage to do that right now. I hope they find it, because we already proved on 1A that that works, and it works extremely well. And I think if NPR stuck to that, it would be okay. At least, I hope it would be okay. I'm gonna catch my breath and look at the chat. I did ask you in the title of today's show, you know, what do you want from the media? And do you even know? I think that's a question that's, and you don't, you don't have to give me an exhaustive answer right this second. But I think that's a question that we need to work out between the press and the public. It's hard to connect with people if you don't know them. And I think we need to kind of reacquaint ourselves to you in a very open, candid kind of way so that we could reestablish or maybe establish that relationship and try to fix some of what's broken. Let me just peruse the chat. First of all, Holly, I saw your comment on YouTube. Lord Jesus, it's been a week. Well, <laughs> yes, amen to that. So somebody say hallelujah. Yes, Lord, it has been a lot of a week. Let's see. Gene wrote on YouTube, thought hard today, and I know what happened to NPR. Too many liberal comedians on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. You know what? That show is such a bugaboo for some people. I'm not blaming you for bringing this up, Gene, but I know that like 
because NPR is such a news heavy network and wait, wait, don't tell me deals in the news. People look at the show as if it's part of the editorial news product of NPR. It is not. <laughs> it's just an entertainment show. But I do think that when you have an organization like NPR that is so much about the news, you got to be really careful how you deal with a show like Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. And I think that on to an extent, it's up to people to be a little bit more mature and to just be adults and be like, that's news. That's not. So some of it I kind of have no real tolerance for. But you're right. I mean, I hear I hear that. And the comedy does indeed kind of pull very hard to the left, but comedy pulls hard to the left. I find that more conservative comedians are not always as funny because a lot of conservative comedians seem to to build their jokes on a sort of mean-spiritedness that just doesn't really hit. It's hard to be subversive in that way. Some do very well. Jim Brewer, who used to be on Saturday Night Live, tends to tack a little bit more to the political right. I watched one of his comedy specials, brilliant. He was amazing. He was telling stories about just being a dad and raising kids and like brilliant storyteller. I mean, one of the best I've ever watched, Jim Brewer. I wish I could remember the name of the special. Rem remind me later and I'll look it up. So good. But I think it's just kind of easier in that sort of like hip urban comedy way in urban areas that tend to lean more to the left anyway, to feel more congruent with the mood of the room. I don't know if there's a way to reconcile that. Maybe that's kind of inherent to comedy today. I really don't know. But I have seen Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me be kind of like a for some people. And then they sort of remember what the network is and they, they breathe and then it's fine. Aaron, I see you on YouTube. Aaron writes, I want media to challenge power and not be stenographers. I want media to be objective, not neutral. I hear you on that. I totally hear you on not just being stenographers. I think there is, of course, merit in having a record of precisely what people say. So in that regard, yes, we need some, you know, we need C-SPAN, for example. C-SPAN serves a very, I don't want to say this in a pejorative or diminishing way, but kind of a stenographic function in terms of like, it's just everything that these committees do all the time. And if you need it, you go to c-span.org and you can search for it and boop, it pops right up. So in that regard, I think the stenographic aspect is valuable. In terms of challenging power, I think that's also important. I think holding power to account is important. Sometimes the feeling of like challenging power of like, what are you doing with my power? You, you better put it back and you better tell me what you're doing with it. Sometimes news can be very performative. And in that regard, I think you can be challenging without being punchy. So that may be just a tonal thing for me, but I don't particularly consider that necessary. In terms of objective but not neutral, I think I understand what you're getting at. I wrote a piece on my Substack about what I call clinical journalism, which is my way of viewing it that came out of my work on 1A to deal with this idea of objectivity. My view is that to be objective is an ability, not an identity. Let me say that again. Objectivity is an ability. It's not an identity. Here's what I mean. If I was a cancer researcher, I'm not objective about cancer. But I do need to be able to view cancer cells objectively and understand them as they are. The goal is still to cure cancer. But I can't judge my sample. I can't sit there cussing, damn you glioblastoma multiforme, I just hate you so much. Like that does not actually solve the problem. I gotta be able to set that aside just long enough to do my work. And then later on, I can say what the hell ever I want about cancer as long as I'm away from the lab. The key, as I see it, is to remember how we need to deal with our work when we're in the lab, as it were. The trick is for the public to give us permission to still be whole human beings, to still be real people. So we're not pretending to believe things we don't believe because that's a form of a lie. And I don't feel like lying to you. I don't think you deserve to be lied to. I'm not gonna pretend to be objective about racism. I'm not. But I can have a very clinical conversation, and did on our air on 1A, with people who, for example, 
venerate the Confederate flag or believe the Confederate monument should still be standing. I can ask clinical questions like, where did this belief come from? What was the first statue you looked at and felt something meaningful for? What is that feeling? What is it meant to you to see these statues brought down? Things like that, that can help understand what I believe is a cancer of racism without judging the person who takes the time to talk to me. So I think there's a third way. I don't think it's just that everything has to be either, you know, Reuters, AP, CBS News with absolutely no ideological bent or MSNBC and Fox, right? And I'm, I say that having worked at MSNBC with no regrets about being an anchor there. I think there's another way. And I think it's a way that allows people to be fully honest and fully present about who they actually are and not play games with that. I don't see the point of asking people to pretend to be something they're not. And I saw somebody in the chat, you just put a thumbs down. I would like to know why. Please put that in the chat as well. And that's cool, that's totally fine. But I don't see the point of having every news organization forced to have every single journalist do every single thing exactly the same way. Because some people aren't gonna want that. If you want news from a conservative perspective that's still based on the facts, but is interpreted through a right-wing lens, that's fine. That is absolutely no threat to me. It's better if you have those options, as long as you're clear on what they are. Now, does NPR need to be that? No, for the left or the right or whatever. But I don't see a problem as long as I'm clear on what I'm getting from you, and I know the standards that you hold yourself to. Then you can make the choice. Does this news organization suit me? Does it not suit me? Then again, maybe the problem is deeper than that. Maybe there's a little nostalgia going. Maybe there's a little bit of declinism going on. Ah, oh, things used to be so much better before. Well, today we lost a lion of broadcast news. And I think something that he said about the impact of television might be helpful in having this conversation. You may or may not have heard about it, but I wanna play you a clip from one of the greatest anchors who ever lived. It's a clip from Robert McNeil of the McNeil Lyra News Hour. I'll get to that next.
This is The Nightlight. I'm Joshua Johnson. Good to be with you. Remember, you can go to nightlightjoshua.com to find all of my social media links, to find the link to my Substack page, which you can support as a free or paid subscriber, to find the podcast links as well. And remember, you can watch The Nightlight as a video podcast on Spotify. Video podcast support is coming to my Apple podcast feed. I promise, I promise, it's on the way. You'll also find the merch store where you can find branded Nightlight merchandise as well as the gullible Ain't Sexy t-shirts. There's an online tip jar where you can drop a few dollars in just to show your support of the program and also send me a note letting me know what it is that you like about the program, what you'd like to see more of or perhaps less of. And you can also contact me through the site, but be sure to contact me by email anytime, joshua at nightlightshow.com. Whatever you do, please follow me over on YouTube at Nightlight Joshua. Click the notification bell and select all to make sure you get notified of all new events and programs and live streams. They are generally regularly scheduled, but occasionally I will do some programs that are just spur of the moment. And I will also post more shortened versions of key segments from the program. But everything you're looking for is online at nightlightjoshua.com. Let's dive back in with some more of your comments. Holly on YouTube writes, okay, but haven't we turned community, that sense of public media as a community service, into something political? By we, I mean not us, but them, I guess. The mission of public media runs counter to the I'll take less if they get none principle of people who wouldn't pay for free radio. Holly, I hear you on that. At least I think I do. Let me take the second part first. I know that there are a lot of people who are like, why are we spending our money on public media? And, and I don't know why people would want to pay for this. And why are we putting tax dollars to it? To be clear, only about 1% of NPR's budget comes from federal sources. The biggest chunk is underwriting and then individual contributions to stations. So stations and underwriters overwhelmingly are the ones who fund public radio. Personally, I'm okay with that kind of funding because my tax dollars, and I'm just thinking about this logically, if my tax dollars can go to schools that I will never send children to or to build roads that I will never drive, why not to create an educational service that benefits other people? How is that so very different other than that it reflects our own political divides back to us? Is that the issue? Is the issue in the substance of NPR or is it in the reflection that we don't like? And if it is reflecting something, isn't that useful? So that at least we have a picture of something we can influence or change? I don't know, that's how I see it. Other people may see it differently, that may change tremendously in the future. But in terms of the sense of public media as a community service being turned into something political, I don't think it's been turned into something political. It was always political. I mean, back from when, you know, Lyndon Johnson signed the Public Broadcasting Act back in 1967 to when, you know, I mean, Reagan went after public media. Donald Trump is going after public media now. It's been a very long time punching bag. And a lot of the original 90 or so NPR stations that founded the network back in the 70s were connected to colleges and universities. And just like now, because there's nothing new apparently politically, colleges were always considered these liberal bastions. And so coming out of colleges and having this network for a lot of educationally affiliated stations, the political lines were already drawn. That was bait. So I feel like a lot of this kind of, aha, we finally uncovered something at NPR is just bunk. It's just dumb. It's like we've been through this. We have been through this over and over. Now, the idea that NPR stations and the network have not found a more full-throated, successful way to just pound down on this old ass argument by now is annoying. Whenever I had to speak in different parts of the country about public radio or public media, whether it was to donors or to the general public or on air or in interviews, I knew how to answer these questions. I'd already formulated the thoughts. That's part of why they sent me to those funding events because I knew how to talk about it. And the fact that, I, that there aren't more of us who just know how to do just some very basic talking points, that we know how to beat back these old, musty, old arguments, that is a huge loss. And I think if NPR wants to survive, it's gonna have to learn how to, how to fight a lot harder. It's gonna have to learn how to make that fight and how to throw knockout punches to just kill these arguments and be like, what else you got? Nothing? Good, shut up and let me go back to work. In so many words. I know that NPR people tend to be very nice to the public, but you know, air nine and then you just gotta let them know. 
Dark Forever Clear on YouTube wrote, I thought the audio was pretty cool. Yeah, that's one of the things that people fell in love with, that driveway moment. It's like you get sucked into this sound and then you realize you've been imagining what you've been seeing so long that you're, you haven't been like, you need to get out of the car. That's exactly it. It's the art of what we do that I think makes people really love it. Oh, Aaron, how nice. I saw Aaron wrote, I love Forum. That's where I first heard you on the airways. Oh, thank you. That's very, very kind. Forum was a good experience. Hard to do an hour show, especially when I was new to it. But yeah, that was a, that was a very good experience. Thank you. Solange the First asked on YouTube, how do they decide what to cover? Who makes that decision, corporate or individuals? Let me answer this for public media, and then let me answer this for different kinds of news organizations. There are some things that you will see on air on, say, cable news that are sponsored segments. CNN does a number of these, particularly with health, with travel. If you ever watch CNN International, where it looks like there are no real commercials, but there'll be a feature about, like, travel the Orient in association with Lufthansa, you know, something like that. That is clearly a sponsored segment. BBC News does this sometimes on its international network, which is a commercial network. So some of those are segments that the organization wants to do, but they offer it up to a company to be sponsored. That's different from the news product. The news product is almost always hard, fast firewalled away from the corporate teams. When I was on MSNBC, when I was at NBC News Now, I had no dealings with the corporate people, none. I didn't know anybody at sales. The hell do I need to talk to sales for? Now, if they're talking to my bosses higher up, in ways I cannot hear, I couldn't speak to that. But I would find it hard to believe, at least when I was there, that any sponsor or any donor would be like, hey, could we do something like this? Now, if there is a, 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 a coverage area that, say, a local station or NPR wants to sponsor, wants to get done, they might find a foundation who funds that kind of work to put money into it. So you might hear, you know, NPR's coverage, of, I'm making this up, just, this, just for example. NPR's coverage of climate change is funded by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, helping to create a more just, verdant, and sustainable world online at macfound.org. So you would hear that during the piece. Within those deals, however, and I've seen this over and over, I have made deals like this. Within those deals are stipulations that when you fund our work, that's all you do. You don't get to pick stories. You don't get any approval over any of the work. You put money in our hands because you trust us to do the work. If you don't trust us to do the work, don't fund us. That is always a requirement of that kind of coverage. To not require that would be an enormous breach of trust that I don't think the journalists themselves would go for. The rank and file reporters would be like, screw these guys, I'm not doing this. We would rebel. And believe me, public radio reporters are a feisty bunch. <laughs> they will cuss you out and they will let you know what they think because we take this very seriously. Like this is our art and we take our art form extremely enormously seriously. So it's gonna be different. Usually coverage decisions are made by the people in the newsroom. Sometimes they can be funded by someone externally but the coverage decision is still made internally. But it's different for all kinds of different organizations. So it's a fair question to ask but I never, Personally, I never, ever, ever, ever had anyone who told me what to fund, or excuse me, told me what to report. Let me keep going through your chat. I really appreciate these comments, by the way. Dark Forever Clear wrote on YouTube, I just, wanted, I just want to be educated about reality, how things work, etc. Again, that's what I loved about 1A. I learned so much that I wasn't taught in school. I got different points of view and was enlightened a lot. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you, again. And I think that's kind of the key. My favorite kinds of questions in journalism, typically, are how does that work? Or how did you do that? Or how did you think that through? I found those kinds of things much more interesting because they make a narrative within the coverage. Instead of asking, you voted for this bill, why? I would much rather ask something like, you voted for this bill, walk me through the thought process of how you got to yes. That to me is much more interesting. Well, first I thought about this, and then someone told me that, and finally, the, and it gives you a little bit more of the, of the underlying argument for it. 
in ways that I think are much more useful. And to me, that's kind of, that's kind of the sweet spot. It also prevents people from feeling quite so defensive because it allows them to presume that their logic on this is worth talking about, that they're just not being treated as stupid for the way that they made the decision. And also, as a journalist, if there is something to be picked apart, you have laid it out for me. So I don't have to assume what you're thinking. I can just repeat what you're thinking because you just told us in your own words. Does that make sense? It's a lot more of a reasonable approach to me in terms of how you get into other people's points of view and how you do it in a way that lets them know that they're heard. Maybe they're gonna try to spin you on that, but at least you are able to compare their spin to the facts and then you've got something useful to compare it to and you don't have to kind of, you know, presume what they're, what they're thinking. Pam wrote on YouTube, this mirrors the challenge the teachers have. They're charged with educating 30 plus students in a way that they can learn when they all learn in a different way. Amplify that by the viewership count. Yeah, that's a way to put it. I think that's a good way to put it. And my mother, who's a teacher, she's going to be like, mm -hmm. <laughs> just you wait. She's going to text me after the show and be like, Pam was right. And I think that's it. I mean, people, and I think even to carry your image further, people feel a way about their kids, right? And so I think NPR and just the press in general is something people really feel a way about. I, I wonder if Americans realize that they are so harsh on the media because they would really love to see it do really, really well. I don't think Americans realize how much they actually like the press when it does well. But for some reason, we've gotten in this cycle where we can't view the press as an entity that's, going, that's growing, often because it rarely is. It just kind of likes to do the thing that makes the most money. But in those institutions like NPR, that are evolving and evolving and evolving, I'm amazed that we don't actually see that evolution as a good thing. And I would love to know from people kind of like, okay, who, who do you think is knocking it out of the park right now, right? If, if you could pick in terms of what you say your values are, who em is emblematic of those values? Who embodies them now? And what specifically are they doing that you resonate with? That would be super useful. And, but I think it's just, you know, People are busy and lazy, and it's, it's asking someone to do that degree of deep thought about something that I think ultimately they only care about when they're upset in some cases, may be asking more than people are willing to do. I, I think that everyone, every station, not even just every NPR station, every station, every network, every newspaper, it needs a public, you know, forum. It needs some kind of an... You know, at, at WAMU, my old station in DC, we had that community advisory board. Lots of NPR stations have community advisory boards. Different from the board of directors that oversees like fundraising and stuff. But this is often just a group of leaders of local community organizations, or maybe just members of the general public, who get together on a regular basis to just talk about how well that station is doing at serving the needs of the community. And they can also bring things up and say, hey, you guys may not know this, but such and such is going on in so and so part of town. If you want to talk to someone about this, I can connect you to them. You might be interested in looking into this. Now, that's not a requirement for them to cover it, but at least you have a regular conduit for the public to say, I see something that I think you should see too. It would, it would be a big help. But I also think that ABC News needs that. I think that the Washington Post needs that. I think Reuters needs that. I think NPR needs that. I think MSNBC needs that. I think news organizations need to have a direct connection to actual human being people so that they're not just virtual. If all you know of me is what I show you on this screen, then you're gonna respond based on that. That's why I try to be ultra careful with how I talk to you in this space. When you have an opportunity to meet me, as I hope that one day we do, then you'll be able to judge that against the person that I actually am, and then you will watch this program very, very differently. That's what happened with me traveling the country with 1A. But if all you ever see of me is like 22 minutes of a newscast, and then I say, from Washington, good night. <laughs> and that's the end of the show. Well, then you've got nothing else to go on. And you figure I'm never gonna listen to you anyway, because you have no way to meet me, so, who cares what you say about me? You could say anything. You could do anything. You could be as nice or as nasty as you choose because there are no repercussions. 
It'd be different, though, if you saw me in person. That, I think, is why the relationship between local news anchors and the public is vastly different than the relationship between national anchors and the public. Because you might see your local anchor at the drugstore or at the supermarket or at the ball game. You're not going to see Lester Holt at the movies <laughs> unless you live in his neighborhood where he goes to see movies. It's very different. By the way, I'm not picking on Lester. Lester is a lovely, lovely human being. But you know what I'm saying. It's a very different kind of relationship. Oceana23, I see that you responded. Thank you for, for owning up to the thumbs down, and I appreciate that. I'm glad that you got in the chat. Oceana23 wrote, I thumbed down as a longtime donor slash contributor. NPR let me down. Subscriber since 1981. I appreciate that. I would like to know, though, how they let you down. Is there something that they did or didn't do? Is there something they said or didn't say that let you down? I don't want to turn this into an argument, right? I'm not trying to, like, find something that I can use against you. I actually do want to know if there was a... You know, relationships with the news are kind of like love because you may not always remember the moment you fell in love, but you know the moment you fell out of it, or you might. And it's kind of like trust. You may not realize the moment that you came to trust somebody. For some people, it's very acute. The civil rights movement or the Watergate scandal or whatever it is that was the moment or that you came to trust us or 9-11, like that you, you kind of saw what we do in a different light. And I would really love to understand these ebbs and flows of trust. I'm also super disappointed, for example, that networks like NPR are not doing this on a regular basis and publishing it to the world. There is a great studio space at NPR, right in the first level of the building, Studio One, this big audience space, which would be great for having events. If I had remained with 1A, I was determined to do the show from NPR at Studio One, alas. Anyway, it would be very wise for us to bring people together and ask these kinds of questions and make it okay for people to just complain respectfully. You have every right to complain about what you see on any network, see, hear, or read. You're totally within your rights to go, hey, that didn't work for me. Now, whether we agree with you or not, that's different, right? It depends on the substance of it, what you say, what you meant, and, and the evidence for it, and whatever. But you're entitled completely to be like, oh, I don't like this and to tell us directly. We owe it to you to at least hear you out, but that will be a much more reasonable conversation if we invite you to share your thoughts, rather than if someone like this guy throws a stink bomb in the middle of the room, and then everybody's running around like crazy. That's why I have zero respect for Yuri Berliner's article in the Free Press. He's been in communication long enough to know the impact he would have. He must have known that he was going to set that building on fire with what he did. And I can't trust you to build anything when I just saw you commit an act of arson. Why would I invite you to help rebuild? Screw this guy. But if, on the other hand, NPR had been more proactive and more public, and more vocal, in inviting both fans and critics alike into the house to get to know them, to speak directly, to share their thoughts directly, then this guy's comments wouldn't mean a damn thing because they wouldn't need him to express their views to NPR about what they dislike. They could do it themselves. You see the difference when you build actual meaningful connections with people? That's what 1A did. That's what so many public radio programs all across the country do every single day. It's to build meaningful connections, transformative connections, and those have power. And I think if it's going to survive now, if, if, if any network is going to survive, particularly NPR, and I believe NPR is going to survive, it will be strengthened by building those connections so that when someone says, oh, do you know what Joshua Johnson did? I heard he did such and such. You, because you and I have been chatting for a while, you'll be able to go, Joshua Johnson? The, the one who was, who was on NP? Nah, that doesn't sound like him. Where'd you hear that? That is the win. And I think we would be able to call it a win if people would have been able to go, 
NPR, like na National Public Radio, the one on the, nah, that doesn't sound like them. That would be the win. That would be the win. Oh, Lloyd, I see your comment as well. Lloyd wrote on YouTube, your journey at MSNBC sounded challenging for you, but your shows came across as fresh and heartfelt. So you are doing it. Thank you. That's very, very kind of you. It was tough. <laughs> I got to MSNBC one month before COVID hit. So yeah, it was a, it was a thing. Or I got to MSNBC full time one month before COVID hit. And then it was, it was a, it was a lot. It was a, it was a lot. <laughs> but you know what? It was also a very good, it was a very good experience. I'm glad I did it. I learned a tremendous amount from being there, even though it wasn't a place where I ultimately thrived or where I was ultimately meant to be. But it, you know, it, um, it was worth doing. It was very much worth doing. Let me get to, hold on, I just saw a comment I wanted to make sure that I included. Oh, Stephen, Stephen Beard, I see you on Facebook. Hey, Stephen. Stephen wrote, hang on, I just want to adjust the font so it all shows up. Stephen wrote, so much of Mr. Belinder's criticism piece was disingenuous to me, and I'm glad you've touched on that. It almost seems like Mr. Belinder wants NPR to be less diverse and wants NPR's journalistic direction to be more about chasing right-wing conspiracy theories than reporting actual news and facts with critical thinking and truthful analysis. Mr. Berliner's criticism of NPR falls flat and felt unoriginal to me. Stephen, I appreciate you saying that. And yeah, I, I would, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if there's any way for me to know. But that was one thing that I questioned in the piece was whether he was being disingenuous. I don't know why you would work at the network for 25 friggin' years and then light the place on fire unless you're on the way out the door. So far, Yuri Berliner still works at NPR. Oh, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier for those of you who came in late, he still works for NPR. He dropped this piece while he worked at NPR and did not tell his bosses about it before he did it. Right? So I don't know why he would do that. Maybe we'll find out with the fullness of time. And that's why I kind of wonder about whether it is disingenuous or what is going on or, or whatever. It just, it seemed a little strange. So I'm not, ent not entirely sure what the hell to make of it. But yeah, I, I thought that also it was a very narrow kind of set of coverage issues. I mean, it's easy to focus on the hot buttons like politics and race and Trump era you know, stories and controversies. And I think if you just look at it through that lens and say, well, people don't trust us as much because we're, you know, we're too woke and we're not as white. Like, what does that mean? And granted, I am putting words in his mouth, but he did complain mightily about diversity programs at NPR. So he's got an issue with the shifting diversity and dynamics of the company as a result. That much is clear. I, I don't know why else that would be the thing you focus on unless that was the thing you considered most important to making your case. Could I be wrong about this? Absolutely. But I sort of, I, I, that stood out to me in terms of the way that he did what he did and uh, <laughs> just the like, the, the, ah, just the hue and cry of that. It was, it was very, very intense. Dark Forever Clear, let me get back to another one of your, here it is. Also wrote, <coughs> excuse me, also wrote on YouTube, I got so tired of hearing opinions about what was happening in the news that I just decided that I wanted to hear what actually happened, not someone's opinion about it while missing the facts. That's when I started listening to NPR. Yeah, I mean, oh, wait, hang on. Did I miss one? No, I got it, I got it. Um, yeah, I, I, I hear that. I hear that entirely. I do think that there can be value in hearing a variety of different opinions about what's happening in the news, I think the trick of it, and I really, I had to figure out how to do this on 1A when I was there. Because remember, 1A launched at the very beginning of the Trump administration. So all three of the years that I did that show, I was working in Trump era America, like the, the heart of it. One of the things that was tough was being able to invite people on who were pro-Trump or anti-Trump and still stick to a, a set of values that I believed were the right way to do the show that 
were in line with my values and with the standards that NPR had set. And I was never going to build a program that felt incongruent with what NPR expected. I always wanted us to be the best show on NPR and to be the one show that people were like, that. That's what I want. More of that. And I think the way that I had to figure out how to do it was to talk to people beyond their ideology and figure out how their ideology locked into the person who they are and not just the issue that they were there to talk about. You know what I'm saying? So if I'm talking to you about, and I'm just for an example, the crisis at the Southern border wasn't uh, as nearly as big a story then as it is now. But if say we're talking about the Southern border, say we're talking about it today and you have very strong views about restricting the entry of migrants and closing the border and building the wall and increasing troops there and, and border patrol troops and whatever. Okay. So we talk about that. Fine. But I also want to know your story. And a point of view is not a story. There's a huge difference between perspective and narrative. And I think the difference between those two things is kind of the ultimate dividing line for me. So if you tell me you believe that the government should, should build the wall and close the border and, and put more border patrol on the border and so on. Okay, fine. Where do you live? What part of the country are you in? Well, I'm in Indianapolis. You are about, you are nowhere near the southern border. What made this issue so important for you? Well, and then you tell me your story. So if you are a person who lives, say, in Indiana, and you are fired up about the southern border, but you live nowhere near the southern border, I want to know why that fired you up so much. And that story where you tell me who you are, not just what you believe, is way more useful. Now, if you live in Brownsville, Texas, well, that's on the southern border. Tell me that story too. But regardless of that, it puts your views into a context that allows people to make decisions that are way more useful than anything I could throw out there. So my way of staying out of those ideological rabbit holes, especially when I only had one side of a story represented or only one point of view represented, was just to ask about people's story. Everything comes back to story. Tell me who you are. How did you become this way? Where did it start? Where did it go from, from there? What was the most important to you? What would you like to see next? What are you hoping for? What are you concerned about? What are your hard red lines that you will not deal with, lines you won't cross? That's how I figure out who you are. That kept me out of politics. I was able to work around politics by focusing on people. When in doubt, come to people. When in doubt, tell your story. That is the best gift that 1A gave me. When in doubt, tell your story. Period. Period. Your story is the one thing that I cannot argue with you about. You know your story. No one else does. No one else knows your story as well as you do. I have to come to you for that. And when I do that, that means I have to show you the respect of letting you tell your own story. And I think as long as we're speaking with respect, everything gets better. And it gets better really, really quickly. I wanna take one more break. I'm gonna to get to a few more of your comments. Please feel free to put in the chat if you like anything else that's on your mind, where you'd like this to go from here, or just anything else that you've been kind of kicking around as it relates to this. This was super helpful, by the way. I also do wanna tell you a little bit about the movie Civil War. I know I said that I was gonna give you my review today. I realized, thanks to my wonderful partner talking this out with me, that it doesn't make sense to do a spoiler-filled review of the movie the day the movie comes out nationwide. I have a ton of things to say. I'm going to write that in an article on Substack, which will drop tomorrow. But I do want to talk to you a little bit about a few of the things to keep an eye out for if you do go see Civil War, and we'll get some more of your comments as well. Also. I did want to play that little clip from Robert McNeil. You may have heard that he died today at the age of 93, lived a very good long life. He gave an interview to the Television Academy, which has an amazing YouTube channel filled with interviews with all kinds of classic TV stars. It's, it's amazing. And one of the clips from that archive said something about television that I think is very relevant to our conversation about NPR and really all the media. We'll get to that before we go.
Welcome back. Let's continue our conversation about the press. And I do want to get to one comment from Oceania 23. Where is it? There it is. Oceania 23 wrote on YouTube, speaking of arson, I mentioned arsonists. I saw lots of acts of arson in my city of Seattle during 2020 and 2021. NPR responded by publishing In Defense of Looting. Now, when you posted that, I went to go look for it, and I found the piece that you are referring to. Thank you for bringing it up. I think, if I'm looking at the right thing, that you are talking about this piece from NPR's Code Switch, which is called One Author's Controversial View in Defense of Looting. It's dated August 27th, 2020. So there is indeed that piece. I do know, and I again, I would not have expected you to know this particular piece of it, but they did put an editor's note on it soon thereafter that says, this story was updated on September 1st, 2020. The original version of this story, which is an interview with an author who holds strong political views and ideas, did not provide readers enough context for them to fully assess some of the controversial opinions discussed. And it talks to the author, and this is after the George Floyd murder happened and some of the, the protests and occasionally riots and property violence that, that broke out thereafter. And someone from Code Switch interviewed Vicki Osterweil about her book, In Defense of Looting, a self-described writer, editor, and agitator who has been writing about and participating in protests for years. And so it includes a number of questions. How do you define looting? Talk about the distinction you see between rioting and looting, and on and on from there. Talk about rioting as a tactic. So it's it seems, and again, <clears throat> I haven't had the benefit of listening to this segment before you brought it up, but because I was busy in New York trying to deal with our own coverage of everything going on. But it seems like this is both a treatise about the act of looting, kind of from an intellectual academic standpoint, and also a perspective on looting. I look at some of the questions in the piece, and I'm just looking at this piece of the transcript. You know, there's a question asking, in your book, you note that a lot, a lot of people who consider themselves radical or progressive criticize looting. Why is this common? Another question... During recent riots, a sentiment I heard a lot was that looters in cities like Minneapolis were hurting their own cause by destroying small businesses in their own neighborhoods, stores owned by immigrants and people of color. What would you say to people who make that argument? And so on. There are a number of questions that are quite critical of looting. I think what perhaps might have been, and again, I'm saying this, I need to go back and listen to the piece before I can really give a strong critique of this. In the circumstances where I needed to do a segment or an interview or an hour about a really tough topic, I tried to ask questions that were critical of the point of view, that were incisive, but also because, again, radio is an art, and there is a huge element of performance to this. I would also try to ask the question using the kind of language and tone that an everyday person might use. So if I was doing the interview about looting, for example, one of the questions I might have asked is, just to be clear, Ms. Forgive me, I want to get her name right. Excuse me. Is it Oster Osterweil? Just to be clear, Ms. Osterweil, you're not saying that looting is okay, are you? And asked it just like that. I think it's important to ask questions that tonally reflect that you get what an average person might be thinking of this right? You're not suggesting that people should loot, right? Looting is not protected speech under the First Amendment. Looting is a crime. We do agree on that, right? And then go from there. Because I do think it's important not to make people feel like they won't get a fair shake from you. But that applies to listeners too. You have to know that you're getting a fair shake from me. That I not only respect the guest, but I don't respect the guest at the detriment of the audience. Because something that controversial, you have to know that I'm connected to reality. No one wants to be looted. No one wants to endure a riot. But if we're going to have the conversation, it's not going to sound like it's grounded in reality unless I ask at some point, you're not saying this is okay, right? Like, how does, how does that work? And tonally to make clear, hey, I'm, I'm not 100% here to be on your side. I need to be able to look at this from an array of points of view. And the way you get permission to do that as an interviewer is you start with questions 
like the one that was here. How do you define looting? But also, tell me your story. How did you come to hold this view? I also would have asked, have you ever looted? Just to get it out there. What has your experience been? And that's a real controversial question. But if we're going to talk about it, let's talk about it all the way around. What has your lived experience been in looting? I think at a certain point it can feel so academic as to feel cold. And if it feels cold, it doesn't feel real. And it's hard to quest, hard to trust if you don't ask those kinds of questions. I'll put it like this and then I will leave this issue alone. Anyone who's ever heard me kind of lecture on journalism, like I'm doing right now, journalists need to do it. You probably heard me make the comparison between light and heat. Here's what I mean. Science teaches us that everything that creates light creates at least a little bit of heat, but not everything that creates heat creates light. I believe that journalism is exactly the same way. There's lots of journalism out there that is very heated, that is very sensational, that's designed to fire you up, but it doesn't illuminate. On the other hand, there's also a lot of journalism that's so busy being bright, examining the geopolitical and sociological ramifications of the situation, that it's cold. And because it's so cold, it doesn't feel human. It feels like it's disconnected from reality. I think both approaches are wrong. I prefer journalism that is more light than heat, but not all light and no heat. Does that make sense? Reason being, there are issues that you are heated about for very reasonable reasons. You get real upset about certain things because they affect you or your family or your business or your community or your nation in ways that you feel viscerally. And for me to force you to squeeze all of that emotion out, to wring the fire out of you so that we can have a very intellectual conversation is to denature you. It's to require you to be someone else as a condition of doing the interview. And I consider that wrong. I think we have to be able to be proficient and professional enough to take people as they are. And if you get real emotional over something, it's okay for me to just bear with you and just give you a few seconds to get it out of your system, presuming you're being reasonable and respectful, right? Just take a minute. Like that emotion is part of the story. Maybe people need to hear what you said. Maybe they need to know why you're upset. And I think sometimes in NPR's desire to be as neutral as possible because it knows that people are looking at it in a certain way, we might be better off if we were just real, if we just felt like real people and if we prove that we had the proficiency to just take people as they are, not just politically, although politically too, but in all of their lived experiences, that's what I think is going to help more than anything else. That's why I think 1A worked so well. That's why I think people clicked with that show and connected to that show and just loved it very intensely when we came along at a time during the Trump administration when everybody was at each other's throats. They just couldn't deal with anybody that we could deal with everybody. That changed so much for me, and it cemented for me why that approach, that NPR approach, was the best way to do journalism. I wish MSNBC understood that. I wish NBC News understood that. I think they let the wrong person go, because I could have brought more to that organization with an approach that is proven that ennobles people, that lifts people up, and that makes people feel like they matter. Because you do. Maybe one day they'll realize they made a mistake. Then again, why would I want to be with someone who doesn't really want to be with me? Just a thought. Take it with you. I appreciate everybody sharing your thoughts on this. Again, please remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel at Night Like Joshua. Like this video if you've enjoyed the conversation. I did want to share with you one more thing before... I let you go and I go have a glass of wine. You may have heard that today we lost a lion of broadcasting. Robert McNeil of the McNeil Lehrer News Hour, the co founder of what is now called the PBS News Hour, died today in Manhattan. He had lived to be 93 years old. Robert McNeil was born in Montreal. 
educated in Canada, in Nova Scotia, worked in Canadian broadcasting, then came to the United States, joined up with PBS in the early, early 70s to create a new news program, teamed up with Jim Lehrer for marathon coverage of the Watergate hearings, eventually created a program that became the McNeil Lehrer Report, which was a half hour long. Network newscasts used to only be 15 minutes. Then they expanded to a half hour. Here's one that'll win you a few beers at the bar. What was the first American nightly newscast to go to a half hour from 15 minutes? The CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Anyway, then their show became an hour, the McNeil Lehrer News Hour. Eventually, it became the PBS News Hour, now anchored by Jeff Bennett and Amna Nawaz. And he was just one of the best. I think if anybody feels like that old school standard of journalism had a standard bearer, it would have been Robert McNeil, sometimes called Robin McNeil, affectionately, and Jim Lehrer, who I'm glad that I had the opportunity to meet when I was still at KQED and just learned a lot from. Oh, I want to share something with you that you might find interesting. And while I am looking for this, I want to show you something that Robert McNeil said to the Academy, the Television Academy, which handles out the Emmys. They also do an array of interviews with legendary people in the news business. Robert McNeil talked about how he wants to be remembered, and he, he answered the question in a way that I thought was very useful for our conversation on the future of television and on the future of broadcasting. Here is a clip of what Robert McNeil had to say to the Television Academy. Television is a wonderful medium and a lousy medium. It is, um, it is something that could be put to great purposes or trivial ones or crass ones. And um, I'm making a talk tonight at the International uh, Center for Photography where they're handing out its awards. And I, tell, I say to them, television, is photography's monster daughter. And uh, it is a monster, but nothing ever in the history of mankind has equaled its reach and its impact. And nothing in uh, before has so been able to transform anything it touches and remake it in its, to suit itself. You go to a baseball game. Baseball is made over for television. You're at a baseball game, and there's a pause while you're actually there, including in the World Series. The players all stand around while the wind blows papers around the field and wait until the sun of television shines on them again. It's as though the real thing is happening somewhere else. So taking all that, television has changed journalism utterly. Not just for television, but for print and everybody else. It's changed the whole culture and ethos of journalism. And to have been able to hold the line perhaps Canute-like against a tide that is going to engulf us all in the end, for a few years has been a source of gratification to me because I think television can be used to discuss sensibly but entertainingly serious things as well as silly things. That was Robert McNeil speaking about the potential impact of television and the distorting power of television. He died today in Manhattan. Robert McNeil lived to be 93. I think there is so much in what he said that speaks to why this is happening. I think it is easy to see that certain channels on television have fomented the ecosystem that goes after institutions like NPR, like colleges and universities and others. Whether you agree with the attack or not, it is indisputable that those attacks are amplified and galvanized in certain channels and certain media outlets. I think the other thing that I take from this, and this is not something I've ever talked about with regard to my experience on 1A, but I always feared that one of 1A's greatest threats, and one of the things that I tried to change about the show strategically, probably thinking way more strategically than a host should, I should probably just leave those things to my boss, but <laughs> he'll tell you I wasn't that guy. I was not that chill. But I always thought one of the biggest threats to 1A was television because of the power of television that Robert McNeil talks about. We had talks at one point at WAMU about wiring one of the other studios for cameras so that we could turn 1A into a show like this one. 
where it's produced for both video and audio at the same time and then distributed everywhere. And then possibly could be distributed on television stations. So the idea that I had was we rewire our studio, maybe not the exact same studio we were using, but we rewire a studio that can be an all media studio. And then we release the show, continue to do it live on NPR. But if a PBS station wanted to run 1A, they could because we would have a broadcast ready version of the show ready to go on demand immediately for stations. This is not unusual. The PBS NewsHour also runs on WETA Public Radio in Washington, and it runs on other NPR stations. KQED in San Francisco runs the PBS NewsHour, or at least they did when I was there. So one of the things that I was concerned about is that if we don't get ahead of television, we run the risk of being incapacitated as media converge and converge and converge. Now, whether that will be a fate that 1A meets, I certainly hope not. We did run the Friday News Roundup as a webcast, but a relatively simple one, a pretty bare bones one, nothing like this. And I'm running this off of a computer with a little, little bitty switcher right here on my desktop. But I always believed that was something we needed to do was be in that space and to make sure that we are never not part of the conversation, that wherever the influence was, that we were there too. And it is undisputable that NPR is not as influential as television when it comes to news. Television is by far the number one source of news and information in this country. And I think that just to look at where Yuri Berliner's art article got so amplified after he dropped it, it was on TV news, cable news in particular, but on video news sources. And I think his point is one that we have to take. We kind of got to be everywhere. We have to be wherever the argument is. We have to get ahead of it. We can't let other people talk about us for us. I don't think that's the, the way that it needs to be. I really appreciate you guys being part of the conversation. I appreciate all of your... Your comments on a day when I was very, very pissy. Oh, Dark Forever Clear, I appreciate you. Oh, that would have been my dreams. That would have been awesome. Yeah, see, I think that would have been, I think that would have been fun. I like working, obviously like working on camera. And I think the idea that people could see me would be great. Because whenever people meet me, they're never expecting this to be me. They're like, oh, <laughs> you're Joshua Johnson. I didn't expect you to be so, uh, so tall. Yeah, that's what you were thinking. Hey, thanks for making time for me this week. I certainly hope that you go to nightlightjoshua.com and check out all of my links. Remember, you can always email me, joshua at nightlightshow.com. Let me know what's on your mind. I would love to hear from you. I will see you next week, and I will drop that review of the movie Civil War very, very soon. You can go to the website right now and see my preview of things to consider before you go. So until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thanks for making time for me. Thanks for taking care of me. Enjoy your weekend, and as always, keep shining, because trust me, someone needs your light right now.